click on next now again here's the account provisioning for the analysis servers now what I like to do is I just simply add the current user that you're on and we could go to the data directories and you know change where the OLAP is uh, you know online um, can't even remember the actual <laughs> full-on services analysis uh, programming uh, but you can change where the actual service log directory, temp directory, backup directory, and data directory is actually located for your analysis services. Um, it's not necessary for me, but on larger scale databases and clusters, you actually might want to do that so that it all goes into one general RAID array. So we add myself for it. We're going to click on next. And the reporting services configuration says, do you want to install the native mode default configuration? Setup will install the report server and configure in native mode to use the default values. The server is usable as soon as the setup is finished. Install the SharePoint integrated mode default configuration. If you have SharePoint, you're definitely going to want to go ahead and select this. Or install, but do not configure the report server. I'm actually going to use the default here. Because the default does a pretty good job. If you don't have speci specified locations for all your different reporting uh, services and solutions, Default's a pretty good idea. So we click on next, and it says, "Do you want to report any errors to Microsoft that you have?" Um, we're not going to report anything. Again, it's a pretty standard install. And it goes again another check that you have the install configuration rules and making sure that you have everything passes. If it's a FAT32 file system, if it's 2064-bit install actually. Um, uh, install action, making sure that everything passes. If it's a clustered, if it's an existing cluster, make sure that it's not cr um, c colliding. Um, the FAT32 file system is not a requirement. However, it's a, it, it will create a separate location for it and it, it kind of mimics the FAT32 file system. You either have to have a FAT32 or NTFS to install SQL Server. And by default, 2008 requires you to have NTFS. And as you can see here, we have the overview of what we're going to actually install. And we're going to click on install. Now this is going to take some time, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, and once it's done installing, I'll go ahead and resume. Okay, phew, that's a long install, huh? So, we're now done installing SQL Server. Not really. Now, there is a log file right here that shows you everything that got installed. So, if your boss wants to know about everything, you can just print this off, email it to him, whatever the case may be. However, we're not fully done installing SQL Server. And the reason why I say that is because, for example, if you're configuring this for an application that's going to need outside clients to connect to it, such as, you know, one of the other computers in the network, rather than the local system, it's not actually done yet. We have to configure a little bit more things. Now, if you're familiar with SQL Server 2005, and you've done the install for that, you probably remember Surface Area Configuration Utility. It's no longer in SQL Server 2008. It's finally gone. So, if we go ahead and close out of here, we still have a couple more things to do. We can come in here, and we can go to our tools, and another good report that we can do is if you want to go to the install SQL Server Features Discovery Report, we can click on that. It'll open up an internet browser and it will give you the sta little table, like an HTML table, that shows you the basic things that got installed. So we'll wait for this to run real quick. And notice how it goes ahead and tells us, hey, you install Microsoft SQL Server 2008 R2 on the instance of MS SQL Server. You installed the database engine services, language of 1033, which is US English. You installed the Enterprise Edition and the actual version number, which actually comes really in hand. And you can see that it goes down through the, the multiple things that I installed. Things that aren't necessarily to a particular instance, it goes ahead and skips those, of course. So it's a pretty handy thing. Again, you can print this out and uh, give it to your boss, email it, PDF it, whatever you want. It's a nice little thing to have for uh, auditing purposes, analysis purposes, and reporting purposes. So we'll go ahead and close out of here. We'll close out of the installation center. 
and we're going to go ahead and click on start go to all programs oops I opened up something else here <laughs> I opened up Outlook Express of all things so we'll click on start all programs and we'll go to Microsoft SQL Server 2008 R2 now I notice it has SQL Server 2008 as well as SQL 2008 R2 that's because some of the things for backwards compatibility you got to use the 2008 configuration tools for example the installation center so notice how you have the Visual Studio 2008 and you can see that if you come in here this is actually going to be where your reporting solutions are so under here we're going to go ahead and go to the configuration tools and select SQL configuration manager under here you're going to notice that we have the SQL Server services we can see all the services that pertain to the SQL Server and any other instances that we have in here. If you had multiple instances, you would see them all. Now, this is a filtered list because there are a couple other SQL services that are installed but do not show in this list because they're not necessarily need to. Now, a cool thing about this is it tells you a really brief synopsis of what you're actually looking for right within this little screen. Who's it logging on as? If it's started as automatic or not? and the actual process ID itself. Now, notice how the SQL Server browser service is stopped. Now, this is a very, very important service if you're going to have clients connecting to your computer. And I'll explain it in a second. First, we need to go to our SQL Server network configuration, highlight our instance, which we call MSSQL Server, also known as the default instance, and you're going to see that we have shared memory, named pipes, and TCP IP. Now if you want to authenticate quicker via Windows authentication, enabling named pipes definitely helps. So we can go to the right click and say enable, or we can double click, or we can right click and go to properties and change the thing here to yes. And we can then click apply and notice what's going to say. Any changes made, to, made will be saved, however, they will not take effect until the service is stopped and restarted. We can say OK to that and click OK. Now, it's very important to note, it wasn't saying the server needs to be stopped and restarted, just the service. So we can just simply go back to our SQL services, highlight our service that is for the database engine, hit the restart button, Notice how it's going to stop the service. And then it will start the service. Awesome. So with TCP IP and name pipes enabled, people you're telling this, the instance that, hey, people can connect from outside. What you're not telling the instance is that, hey, I have a service that will allow the connections and authenticate them before it gets to the SQL server and then do the authentication on the SQL server. And that's what that SQL browser service is. It's A, to help other client connectivity components on other machines find the server in general, as well as if they already know where the server is, is to help authenticate and pass it through to the correct instance. So we're going to right click and go to properties and we're gonna leave it as a local service account again we can change this to an administrator account which would probably be a better idea but for right now our, our non administrator account, I'm sorry a domain user account not administrator or we can go ahead and just leave it as local service for right now we'll go to the services tab start mode says disabled we're gonna change that to automatic we're gonna hit apply and you're going to notice that if we go back to the advanced tab and we go to customer feedback you can also report hey w if it fails or not report it to Microsoft again we're never going to do that we'll say okay notice if we refresh here as it was doing already by itself even though we changed it to automatic it still didn't start the service not like if you were to do that on the other side or if you were to do it the service snap in it does start the service so we'll highlight this and we'll just simply hit the start service button. 
Now to confirm that I can definitely connect to this server, I can either do two things. Because my host box is not actually connected to the domain, I'm going to use that SQL Server Administration account, which is that SA account. So we're going to minimize here. We're going to use an outside box, which is my Windows 7 box. We're going to click on Start. We're going to go to Control Panel, Administrative Tools, and Data Sources, ODB, OB, ODBC. We're going to open this up, and we're just going to click on Add a User DSN. SQL Server. Type in like test because we're not going to actually save it. And because it's a default instance, all we have to do is actually just type the actual name of the computer. In this case, mine is called DC. Oh, I'm sorry. Mine is called SQL 0301 for SQL Server. 2003, which is 2003 server, and then to the first SQL server in the group. Next. And notice how it says, do you want to authenticate with the Windows NT? And I don't want to do that because, again, I'm not part of the domain, so it's not going to actually authenticate me. So I'm going to say, with the SQL server authentication login, I'm going to change the connection parameters down here to log in with the SA account. And then I'm going to go ahead and type in the password that I typed in during install. I'm going to click on next. And you're going to notice how it comes right to the screen. If you weren't able to connect, it probably wouldn't come to the screen. So I'm just going to click on next. Next. And just test. And look, it tests successfully. You can just click on OK and cancel. And cancel again. Now you don't have to save it. So one important thing to note is that if you're using SQL Server or Server 2008 and you have the Windows Firewall enabled, you're going to need to make sure that you enable port 1433 through the firewall, as well as enable the executable within the instance directory. And you can find that under wherever you installed the instance. So in my case, it's going to be my computer, C drive, program files, Microsoft SQL Server, the instance that I installed, and it's going to be MSSQL 10.5 instance, MSSQL server, then, and then you're going to see SQL server.exe in here, somewhere. There it is. You not only have to enable this, in order for it to browse and have the browser service available to everybody, you also need to enable the browser service executable, which is under the Microsoft SQL Server under 90, not 100, even though 100 is where the new, all the new stuff is, the browser service is old school. So under 90, under shared SQL browser.exe. Now the browser.exe is actually for all your instances, not per instance. And that's the reason why it's under that shared location of the 90 folder. So. This concludes the install of SQL Server 2008, 2008 R2 Enterprise. If you have any further questions, please go ahead and leave a comment. And please, if you can, subscribe to the channel, and hopefully we can help you out further. So long, and have a good day. Bye-bye.